So, um, here I am again, running an on port boff. Um, I have an agenda and everything, but that doesn't mean that I want to be stood up here talking to you lot for 45 minutes. This is a boff, very definitely. We have a gobby dock already. If somebody or somebody's could help by taking notes, that would be awesome. I will do my usual thing of sending out a summary of what's discussed here and what goes in that document to the mailing lists after the conference. I think that's really important for other people who can't be here and also so we get a, a proper record of what's been said, agreed and people blamed and all that kind of stuff. So, in order, going backwards for once, you'll see why in a moment, ARM64 is the newest of our current ARM ports. Um, it's working quite well. We released it with Jesse. Um, we're starting to see more devices coming available that will actually run ARM64 um, Debian quite well. Um, we're starting to see real server hardware actually turning up and there is more coming. Um, thankfully, there are better standards available for ARM64 than for previous generations of ARM hardware that mean that we don't need to have 17 different kernels, we just have the one and it should all just work with device tree or now um, ACPI is becoming more of a feature especially if you're running server hardware, ACPI is the way you should be running these things. Um, I work with some of the guys who've worked on device tree and ACPI, and the two are basically equivalent in terms of the functionality they give, but ACPI is the better choice for the future just because it's, there are better standards for it. So, on my Jeff, going back a bit, we first released with Wheezy. Um, it uses the um, ARM v7 hard float port, um, port ABI, which defines, which depends on VFP v3 d16. I will explain what that means if anyone wants me to. Good. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Good. Good. Um, it is the standard across. 32-bit ARM Linux distros. This is the thing that uh, Debian, Fedora, SUSE, all of the big well-known distros agreed on as the baseline for their 32-bit ARM v7 ports um, now multiple years ago. So you actually have a fair chance of binaries from one distro actually running on another distro. Um, for those people who are used to the x86 world, uh, that may not seem like much. In the ARM world, this, this was a, oh, hallelujah, this was a major, major win for us. Um, again, we have a reasonable chance of all of the hardware out there now running just using one standard kernel, the ARM MP kernel, MP being multi-platform. Again, device tree makes that possible. Um, the, we have a second kernel available, which is ARM MP LPAE. So if you're fortunate enough to have um, a V7 device with more than four gigs of RAM, you'll want that instead. Uh, more memory is better, obviously. Um, UEFI is now a thing on ARM V7. Um, there are some boards that people are talking about shipping with UEFI firmware by default. Also, due to the work um, that's been ongoing in U-Boot, um, there is a support for enough of a UEFI interface in U-Boot for some hardware that you can now boot by UEFI that way, which actually means you might get things like just working out of the box if you plug in a USB stick, that kind of thing. This is really, really good. Um, if I was more awake, if, if I remember correctly, so it was Alex Graff from SUSE who did the work for this. He's an awesome guy, much kudos to him. He's continuing to work on improving this as time goes on. So, OMEL is the oldest of our current ports. Have I suddenly just got louder? Okay, fine. Not, not just me having a stroke or anything, that's fine. <laughs> 
So Armiel is the oldest of our current ports um, for Armin in Debian, using the soft float ABI targeting ARM v4T and newer. Um, it's still supported upstream in the kernel, in the tool chain and whatever, ish. Um, and I'll expand on that slightly. Um, while obviously people care that you can still build the kernel compilers and lots and lots of core libraries for uh, ARM v4 and so, so on, because hell, ARM still sell, or ARM licensees still sell a huge number of uh, v4 devices and even older, there is a problem, and it's been coming for a while, that lots and lots of the ap bigger applications and libraries further up the stack don't care about v4. This has been fairly obvious for quite a while. We do have problems, for example, if you want to run um, if anything like a modern browser, if you want to get Firefox, if you want to get Chrome, or almost any of the really big, large applications running, you are probably going to have problems. Um, people don't care about this stuff anymore, which is why um, we've been talking about this for the last couple of years. Um, we are planning on dropping Army L from testing soon and not releasing with Buster. That is not a done deal. There is still scope for people to step up and make sure it's supported. Um, but we've been calling out for real commitment from developers for the last couple of years to help out with, with issues as they come up on Army L. And they have been not exactly forthcoming. So I appreciate this is going to be seem unfair to people out there who have Armiel installations on older hardware. Um, but it's the same way whenever any port is dropped from Debian. Um, there were always users, and we appreciate that, and it, we have to, have to apologize to those users. But unfortunately, for, for us to continue to keep something in Debian, we need developers too. Um, by semi-announcing this last year and the year before, we've given people plenty of warning this was coming. Um, as we did release with Stretch, and of course, we're going to be continuing to support RML for the lifetime of Stretch for security. People have at least three years' worth of life left in that existing hardware, which, hell, is not bad even if you just bought it last week. Um, there is a fair chance that when we get round to Stretch LTS, just like Jesse LTS, um, we, would get, we will get Armiel supported there too. You might get five years, but definitely, definitely, if you're depending on Arm v4 um, machinery, Arm v5 machinery running Armiel, now is the time to start thinking about moving on. You have plenty of warning. It's not gonna, it's, it's obviously, it's not gonna go on fire the day, the day we turn it off but you're not going to get security updates forever. And that is a, you know, it's a sad fact, but it's something people should be aware of. So, any comments on that? Do we have dull acceptance? Do we have anybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to grab a mic to make sure? I'm told the microphones in here are okay, but it doesn't hurt. Yeah, but like you say, without the developer support, uh, uh, so if it seems also uh, now is the time to really step up and stand strong if you want that to be supported and absolutely and yes faster i mean dare i say if you have that kind of device it's possibly also worth considering do you need a full debian port for it um we've had the discussion around this again for two maybe three years now um and people have c continued to suggest that we should do other things you know could we do a partial port um, could we do, you know, just, just, just as in just strip out the larger applications that people don't use on this hardware, that kind of thing. 
uh, like X and like LibreOffice and the browsers and things. And yeah, that sounds attractive. But again, what it comes down to is show me the code. Show me the effort to make it happen. For all that, yes, it's, 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 it is certainly something that is technically possible. It act needs actual work. And without that actual work happening and being done by actual developers, it will continue to be pie in the sky for the f basically forever. Um, it's not too late, but people need to be need to be demonstrating work on it now. Just do you want to grab a mic? Sorry, Bill. So the builders for ARM EL, are they ARM V4 or are they no. bigger machines? They are ARM V7. Okay. Um, and that's cunningly just what I'm about to talk about. So we have a mix of machines for our build Ds. We have the main ones, this is a really bad dark photo, these little orange Morvell boxes that Morvell donated to us a few years ago. Our, our Mono XPs, we have seven of those currently um, building away merrily, doing both ARM HF and ARM EL. Um, and they're really nice machines. They are quad core, they take lots of memory. They're absolutely wonderful if, you want a v7, if you'd want a V7 server box. The Scaleway folks actually have a number of machines in the cloud that you could rent, which are essentially this hardware, but in a different form factor. They're really nice, and I'm still very happy and very grateful to Morvell for, for giving us those. Those are awesome. The only downside is they don't have Neon. So if you are running, if you're building software, for example, that has a test suite, if you try and run it on one of these and it depends on Neon, you will get um, undefined instruction in exceptions. You will see problems. Specifically for that, we still have a Freescale IMX53 portal box, Harris, which, was, which has been running now for seven years, I think, maybe six. It's when we first start, previously to the, Army, Army, to the, the Marvell boxes, we had a whole rack of these instead. And they were great at the time, but they're only single core, Cortex-A8. They only have one gig of RAM. Um, trying to build something big on them is awful. However, if you need to debug a Neon issue, it, you know, we, that's deliberately why we've kept this around. Um, so ARM64 does give us more options. We have an AMD Seattle um, hosted in the data center at ARM. We have multiple um, APM Mustangs. I've got one in ARM. There are a few that Lenovo are hosting. We started off the port for ARM64 with a couple of ARM Junos. We still have one of those running. The other one is on my desk because its disk died. And to be honest, we don't need it running anymore. Um, there are more machines coming, I've been promised. Uh, I've been talking to several of the um, silicon vendors who are very keen to, ha to help with the ARM64 port. Oh, and by the way, they might have customers who are demanding that Debian works on their hardware. You know, the two are not entirely unrelated. Um, we, sh we shall see. Now, what, we, what we've been considering for quite a while is trying to move on to more and more ARM64 hardware and start building ARM HF32. Um, so one of the nice things about ARM64, as I said, is it's proper server boxes. And proper server boxes come with nice features, like they go in a rack properly. They have proper power control. They have real ethernet. They have all of the nice features that you want, lights out management, all of that kind of stuff that you want if you're going to put these things into a data center and not have a monkey like me going around go, to go push buttons to reset them when they break. It, you know, it, it matters. The flip side of that is you can't rely on running ARMEL or building ARMEL stuff on ARM64. There are instructions from V4 that, are, that have been deprecated for a very long time and if you try running some of the ARM v4 code on ARM64, you are likely to start triggering exceptions, particularly with the old uh, barrier code. Oh, um, 
I, I had a I had a question kind of on that vein. Um, yeah. We've been running some ARM64 boards, but building uh, ARMHF for the reproducible build stuff. Yeah. And we're encountering some issues with the builds actually working correctly. And I don't. It, it seems like there are some ARMv6 instructions that were gently deprecated in ARMv7 and sure. more harshly deprecated in ARMv8. And yeah. so we're running into some issues there. Are they actually are, are they v6 instructions or are they older? I think v6, but okay. The CP15 so, well, exa ah, so the CP15 thing yeah, yeah. is an older than ARMv6. It goes back to ARMv4. That's the that, and that is the one that specifically causes issues. Um, over time, obviously, for the people who might not be aware, obviously, the, the ARM instruction set has evolved over the years. CP15 barriers were about the only thing available in V4, there were, and there was very little else in terms of support for, um, for, for atomic code. Um, however, once we moved forward to V6 and then on to V7, there were significantly better designed uh, memory barriers and atomics available, and that's what you should be using now. If you're seeing CP15 in, a, in an RMHF build, you've probably got an embedded copy of libgc that is too old. Uh, yeah, it's in uh, GX, anything that calls GHC, basically. <sighs> Great. Which is a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So essentially, th this is where it comes from. I, f I found, I did a, s a scan in Lenaro, God, again, three years ago, maybe four now, looking for embedded assembly in places. Um, and I found, for example, there were a lot, many, many copies of LibGC, the garbage collection library, uh, the Bohm garbage collection library, that were more than capable in a modern version of using proper um, V6 and V7 atomics. But the, put the, the, the upstream software that had embedded the copy had embedded one 10 years ago. And well, you never need to update, do you? <laughs> so those are quite possibly where these problems are coming from. Right. So uh, that seems like an issue we're going to have to explore in greater detail. Oh, absolutely, you yes. Know, um, the compatibility issues of running an ARMHF Chirrut on an ARM64 machine. Sure. I'll make, so the one that found this, that showed me this, was I ran W3M on the console of an ARM64 box. I, I, can't, I think I needed to download a, a, a .deb specifically, and I didn't have any other way. And yeah, it, it seg-faulted. No, you know, it, it faulted immediately at startup. And I thought, what the hell? Um, and that was when, when this one really hit home for me. We need this fixing properly. So definitely, file bugs, talk, ma mail the, the, um, the, the, the ARM list, and we'll go from there. So I dealt with an analogous situation on PowerPC, because uh, the E500 doesn't have the LW sync instruction that right. is all over the archive. Sure. And the solution that is kind of a sleazy hack but worked extremely well was I emulated the instruction in the undefined exception handler. Yes. And the slowdown was imperceptible. So if these instructions are not common. Sure. So we've spoken about this. Um, there is support in the, in the kernel for emulating CP15, like back in the day people added support for emulating the swap, the swap instruction, which was the other common way people did atomics on ancient ARM hardware. Um, you can do it, but what we're finding now is more, as more and more code is built that depends on these atomics, particularly the C++11, the ARM v4 and, and ARM v5 cannot provide hardware assistance to match the model that is needed for C++11 atomics. So you need to have um, a handler, in, you, know, in, you need to have support in the exception handler in the kernel. That is painful and it's not something we should be depending on. So, Adrian. At least uh, the thing for C++11 is that actually, uh, you've probably seen that, right? They recently added the feature that they can implement standard future without uh, atomics and hardware. You can. They have fixed that. So this, this is what kept us from building LLVM on Armil, and it's building now again. Right, but what's the, what's the performance cost? There's got to be something involved. Pe people... Well, 
we can come back to this again in a moment. Yes, yeah, so anyway, this is where we are with the build Ds, and we're looking for using more ARM64. One thing that we can do now with more of the ARM64 hardware is actually run um, build Ds in virtual machines. Um, this is great for uh, better separation, and more, better security, all of those good things. So we're going to see more of that in the future. So now, <laughs> what else can we be doing and what else should we be doing? So Adrian. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just saying that this particular bug was fixed, but I think, sorry for being late, we still have this problem with um, the Basically, uh, we don't have fast CPUs available which can have these old instructions, right? Because I dropped some of the instructions. Ex exactly. Sorry, we were talking that just before you came in the room. Yeah. Yes. But so. uh, using um, emulation is out of the question, I guess. It's because I know they actually do that in OpenSUSE for ARM. Sure. It's technically possible. It's not the right answer long term. Um, specifically with the CP15 exceptions, I think it's emulated on ARMv7. Um, yeah. And then on ARMv8, it's still emulated, but it complains very loudly and to the tune of several thousand log messages per second. Yeah, sure. So exactly, if you're using now common code that is coming out of Qt, for example, anything like that, which is designed around assuming the C++11 atomics, um, Again, your code can be made to work. That doesn't mean you want it to be if it's running potentially tens of times slower. Um, it's a problem, and we, we, we've, we've seen this problem coming for a while, which is why, and again, for the sake of Adrian who came in late, it's why we are looking at dropping OMEL from Buster. Um, as I said, we can technically carry on with it, it will need consistent developer effort focused on keeping it in. Um, none of the existing ARM porters have committed to doing anything about this, which is why we, we know. After a couple of years of discussion, we're now at this stage. Um, this would make history. We'd be the first um, port in Debian to voluntarily drop out of a release instead of being told by the release team it's happening. <laughs> um, does that mean we, we've anti-Vancouvered? Does that mean we've Montrealed, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> um, that's what we're up to. Anyway, we have about 20 minutes more. I will say, please, more porters are always welcome, particularly if you care about this, this topic. We have a fairly active group on IRC and hash Debian arm, you know, nice imaginative titles for, the, for these channels and mailing lists. Please talk, talk about stuff on the mailing list. And look, we, arm has a new logo, by the way, in case anyone, anyone hasn't noticed. And the engineers all love it. Can't you tell? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we did, we spent quite a lot of money, as I understand, I don't know the exact number, on going lowercase. <laughs> it's special. Sure. <laughs> I don't know who wins, who loses. <laughs> yes. Um, sure. Are there any implications? I've, I've heard rumors of ARM being bought out or something. You, yes, you might have heard last year that ARM ceased being an independent company. We were bought by SoftBank, a very large Japanese technology company. Um, the visible effects externally are basically we're not on the stock exchange anymore. That's about it. Um, Masa, um, Masa San bought ARM, he told us. Um, I am an ARM employee in case that's not obvious to anyone. Bought us essentially because he loved ARM and wanted to be part of it. <laughs> Um, had some ideas on things ARM could do more of, but promised us faithfully, and of course this always happens after a takeover, so how big your pinch of salt is is a personal thing. Um, but he, ha he did promise at the time he didn't want to make any big changes. If you're going to spend $30 billion on something and then make major changes, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, 
the only thing that has come through more is that he is clearly interested in IoT devices. Um, so it's not so much that there were less people in ARM working on any, everything else, but if anything, we are, we are hiring more people to do more IoT, IoT things. And we already had a lot of those. So there's, it's, not, it, it's slightly more focus, but not less effort elsewhere, if that makes sense. Um, so far, absolutely, it all seems to be a really good thing, and I'm happy with it. Hector. Yeah, hello. Um, Packet.net gave us a, an offer of hardware. But okay. It's in the, in the cloud, but it's not like real hardware. It's hardware in the Sure. So how comfortable are we running build demons and, and running things on the cloud instead of supporting our own dev boards and tickering with them? That's a good question. We have traditionally always wanted to run all of our official builds on Debian owned, Debian, or at least Debian controlled hardware. So we, act, so we do have machines obviously in data centers all around the world. We don't always own all of it. So for example, um, Lenovo are letting us use a couple of uh, Mustangs um, and those have been very useful for the ARM64 port. Or IBM with Unicamp have given us access to, but I believe not total control over, I could be wrong, a few Power 8 machines which are hosted there. But I think that's still different to just running things in the cloud. Um, what do people think? Um, I think probably for porter boxes makes plenty of sense. Like. Take them up on it. I mean, sure. what's the worst that's going to happen there? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, of course, with my reproducible builds hat on, uh, mm. if we had reproducible builds as a real, real world need, all mm. of a sudden, um, that we makes need more hardware. Yeah. yeah. And then we could do multiple builds on multiple different pro providers, and we'd have greater assurance sure. that nothing fishy is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That would be great. So. Um, as a background, the packet.net stuff, they have some Cavium Thunder X machines, uh, which are incredibly parallel um, ARM64 hardware. They have like 48 cores, lots and lots of memory. Um, they're designed more as network processors rather than um, general purpose, but of course, they've got so much CPU horsepower, they can work very well that way and then you split them up with KVM. So we wouldn't necessarily get a full machine, obviously. We'd be getting um, a two core, four core, eight core, whatever um, virtual machine running on, on those. It's uh, 96 CPU cores, 128 megs of RAM. Which gigs of RAM. Gigs of RAM. Yes. So it's just. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's e it's easy mistake. So so yeah, it's 48 cores per socket, and then they've got two sockets in these boxes. I've seen one of them running in my office briefly. I don't normally get bothered by fan noise. 96 cores in a 2U box. We we turned it on and it drove everybody out the room, <laughs> almost physically, just from the air movement. <laughs> One question, is it true that the Thunder X does not support uh, ARMv7? It has only ARMv8 uh, implemented? No, I'll explain. Because we're trying to build sure. such a big yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. and having a so, fast machine like that would be good. ARMv's naming is incredibly confusing, even for those of us who work for ARM and have access to all of the documentation. Um, so ARMv4, ARMv5, v 6 we are currently up to ARMv8. ARMv8 was the first ARM processor to include support for the ARCH64 um, execution state, which is the first ARM 64-bit instruction set. We now have, and some of this was invented well years after the fact, they've now renamed what previously used to be the ARM instruction set is now called A32, to make it clear it's 32-bit. What was the thumb instruction set is now described as T32, to, to, again, to make clear it's 32-bit. And we now have A64, which is the brand new AR64 V8 instruction set. The, you, it is possible to, to buy V8 CPUs that are 32-bit only. It is possible to buy V8 CPUs that are 64-bit only. 
and the Thunder X is one of those. Yes, it does not run A32 natively. Sorry, and apologies for being pedantic, but unfortunately the only way I can keep it straight in my head is I have to explain those things to me every time I think about this, let alone anybody else. It is confusing. Um, so one of, the pro one of the potential issues with using the, uh, the packet.net machines is absolutely, we could not run native A32 code, we couldn't run ARMHF on those. We could run straight ARM64, we could definitely run as a porter box, that sounds great. Personally, I'm happier with the idea of us keeping our official buildies on machines controlled by us. It gives me warm fuzzies, even if technically it, it doesn't necessarily give us any more real security. It makes me feel better. I don't know about anybody else. Um, as we've been talking about doing things like secure boot, or like Matthew Garrett was talking yesterday about signing code and whatever, we're going to have to think more possibly in the future about actual security of our buildies if we want to actually make better security be better security and not just a pretense. Because of course, if we go and sign a load, a load of code that has been built on machines that we don't, don't necessarily have full control over, I think we're failing ourselves and the community. The, the timing of this, the morning, the first thing in the morning after the, the conference party is awesome, isn't it? <laughs> Thomas? I'm pretty new to the ARM architecture and I like to start uh, playing around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I want to concentrate on 64-bit and, and I need some suggestion which hardware to buy. I know there's this 48 course uh, server hardware. Is there something a bit cheaper? A bit cheaper, <laughs> but but um, yeah, I think I would like to have like four or eight gigs of RAM, uh, maybe four or eight cores, and so any suggestion? Um. Grab a mic if you want to talk, please. There are lots of options, many many options to the point I've lost track of what to recommend. Peter might tell you. I, I've been looking. The problem I've been finding is that they've all been out of my price range. You know, Once you get beyond the kind of hobbyist boards with a gig or two of RAM, which are quite affordable, you get up to the... What are essentially demo boards for server hardware? For yeah. want of a better description, and they have price tags... You know, there was a gigabyte one, for example, that had a price tag, you know, in the 700 pound kind of range, which is far, far more than you pay for a comparable Intel based board, and, you know, far too rich for my tastes. Sure. So, so there's a dichotomy in the market at the moment. Most of the boards that you're going to see are mobile CPUs because obviously that's what, where most of the ARM64 things are going. Almost any mobile phone you buy now is going to have uh, an ARMv8 processor in, it, processor in it, whether they advertise it that way or not. Mm. Um, and so there are lots and lots of the cheaper dev boards are based, obviously, therefore, around those CPUs, which is great, it works, but it does mean you're then going to have typically soldered on very limited memory, you're going to have not great I.O., you're prob you may not have Ethernet, you may not have SATA, and again, depending on your needs, those boards are great for some people. Um, if, however, you want to be able to have something you could run as your own home development system, you're going to want, as you said, 4 gigs, 8 gigs of RAM, a few cores, a SATA port, wired Ethernet, a serial port, the kind of thing to make it usable as a computer. Yeah, then that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I, to I totally get that. Um, but the hard thing is, I honestly can't really recommend anything today that's great. Thomas, uh, you, maybe you want to look into the Debian infrastructure. Uh, we're running, we got a donation from uh, Gigabyte, they're running APM Mustangs. You can get this hardware from Gigabyte, and it's sort of kind of desktop 
the motherboard thing. Mm. Mm. Uh, Sounds good. It's under so. 1,000. Also soft iron. So uh, uh, the soft iron 1,000. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's also in a nice price range, but you might experience some issues. But if you well, like so the you issues the you're likely to experience, unfortunately, are that the, the CPU that they're using is end of life. So they're not going to be making those for very much longer, as I understand. I'd love to be corrected because I would love them to carry on. Mm. Um, the gigabyte boards, um, in fact, th there were two gig gigabyte boards available. One was using the Mustang, and we have a couple of those that we're using at Canova. No, uh, don't we? At Canova. Yes. Um, they also did a cavium based board, again, with the Thunder X. Mm. Um, I have no idea how available those are at the moment. And again, they, as Peter says, they're basically, at the moment, they're demos of server hardware mm. more than actual, you know, please give me a retail price and I can, you know, you can order it from your local reseller. We're not there yet. There's also, Olimex is building some kind of hardware but it's all winner based, like Chinese mm. uh, sure. kind of CPUs. So. Wouldn't, wouldn't, what I read, there are two versions of the Gigabyte board, one with U-Boat and the other with UEFI. So what would you suggest? Always, Which? always UEFI. Okay. Um. <laughs> it should just work. If you can fix the other ones, you'd be... I mean, I, I've, I had to fix a couple of uh, bootloader versions, uh, at least in the past, the past year. And so I'm a bit inclined towards the U-Boot version, even if it may, well, sound weird to the server folks. But uh, the impression is that a lot of these UEFI stuff is a bit locked down and then also similar broke like other bootloaders as well. And you might be lost. Mm. I have, I will admit to some bias. I'm also part of the Debian UEFI team. Um, if you're going to run a mobile device, if you're going to run a dev board, whatever, U-Boot is perfectly fine, it's no problem. So long as you have a sensible U-Boot, finding a sane U-Boot for your board can be harder than it should be. If, they've, if it's all upstreamed, wonderful, you should be able to replace the U-Boot with something that we know will work. I've been bitten over the years by far too many U-Boot implementations on various dev boards, which inexplicably don't support the file system I want to use, or don't support the onboard networking properly, or all kinds of stupid things which are make, make, just make it more painful. Sure. If you want to use your ARM64 machine as a real computer, like just plug it in, use it just like you would with an x86 machine, I would have, every day I would recommend UEFI instead of U-Boot to get something that looks more like a computer, not a dev board. Um, uh, I appreciate I'm not, you know, th other people would disagree, but that's my personal recommendation. Well, uh, with my UVU maintainer hat on, <laughs> um, uh, uh, there's a world of difference. There's this thing called mainline UVU, and then there's all of this other stuff that forked off of it, and most of the problems are in all of that other stuff, which is essentially unfixable. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So the machine I'm currently using myself, I, I, I went out and spent um, $500 on a, on a machine, is uh, a Macchiato bin, which is, uh, uses Marvell's next generation um, CPU, which is ARM64. It's clearly going to be um, in the core of maybe the next generation of NAS boxes, and it does networking um, acceleration and whatever as well. It's got um, a couple of 10 gigabyte ethernet ports on board. It's got, in fact, six separate ethernet connectors on board. You can't use them all at once. Um, it supports 16 gig of RAM. It comes with U-Boot, but there is a UEFI port we're actively working on. It has a PCI slot that almost works. <laughs> um, it's a quad core ARM Cortex A72, um, which is plenty of horsepower, um, and it's got all of the um, it's got all of the bits you'd want. As I said, unfortunately, the PCI is quite broken, and that is a limiting factor. If you don't care about the PCI, you just want a computer that most that basically works. It's got three SATA ports on it and whatever. It's got USB. 
um, it's actually the machine I tested um, for the first time ever. I tested the Stretch 9.0 and 9.1 releases on an ARM64 box that I owned in my own home on the day of release, and it worked well. Yeah, the, it's the Macchiato bin. Um, it started off as a. Um, yes. Uh, ah, in fact, that's a good point. I have the gobby. Oh. Um, I hope so, that some nice people have been updating this as we go. Well, also on the U-boot topic, we have some machines that we cannot upgrade to a stretch because U-boot won't boot that. So that that's how it's spelt, Macchiato bin. There's also the Espresso bin, which is a, another Marvell-based small machine. It's only dual core. Uh, it's a bit more limited. I said the Macchiato bin, there's been a number of us have bought these. We were hoping to be able to put it into, I might have put mine into a little mini ITX case. We were hoping to be able to plug in a small graphics card and actually have a proper ARM64 desktop for reasonable money. But without working PCIe, that's hard. As it is, as a box I can just leave running on my home network, I actually do have something that is reliable and not bad. Of course, if you want everything to work, you will need a kernel newer than Stretch. Such is life when you're running on machines that are being still actively developed every week. Is running a Debian stable release is hard. Um, other machines that I know a lot of people have, the Pine 64 is, you know, I mentioned earlier about the, you know, the mobile platform. Again, that's a mobile SOC that they've put onto a board with a, a, either half a gig, one gig, or two gig of RAM, depending on the version you got. Um, and it's almost all upstream at this point. Um, Andre, one of our kernel hackers in ARM, is doing a lot of this stuff in, on his own time because he wants to make it work. And they now have the U-boot that pretends to be UEFI running on that very well to the point where he was chasing me, wondering why the Debian ARM64 netints didn't work on it out of the box. So we're finding bugs and fixing them as we go. You will probably need to run a backport kernel if you want some of these machines to work well. Uh, in some cases, absolutely. If you want all of it to work, you, you're going to be needing to run an upstream kernel rather than anything in backports even. But of course, that will improve over time. Um, yeah, I, I can speak. Um, I've got a number of uh, ARM64 boards in the, the build farm. The Jetson TX1 is pretty good, but you need to patch the device tree and get a patch that hasn't yet landed in mainline for SATA, but otherwise basically runs a Debian kernel. Yeah. Uh, there's the Odroid C2, which uh, I've had some troubles with, but uh, working on it. And, if people uh, can put some of these into, yeah, the, yeah. into the gobby as well, that would be lovely. So we can list them later. Because the, the fun we always have is exactly this. And I knew it was going to come. So thank you, Thomas. Is always, what board should I buy? I'd want something that works. It's much harder than it should be. And I apologize for that. And, <laughs> Steve, yes. um, do you know something? What's the current status of <clears throat> the big Indian ports or ILP? And all that? is that being developed? Or what's, right. what's going on? Sure, we have one minute remaining, so I can quickly say, um, forget they ever existed, please. And, uh, and for no. the so people have a number of times done lots and lots of other ports on ARM hardware. ARM hardware is by design Endian neutral. You can run it either way, Little Endian or Big Endian. Um, the default has always been Little Endian. But we've had Army B in Debian years ago for the sake of the slug. I won't go into details, it's years ago. We also have people, I've done it myself, I've worked on this myself running a big Endian ARM port on V7. There is also on ARM64, there is a port Wookiee is working on right now in Lenaro, ARM64 ILP32. Um, it is not going to go into Debian. Um, I am quite adamant on that. It is utterly pointless as a day-to-day -day thing for Debian users, so let's not spend any time and on it. 
There is a big Endian version of that too. It's complicated. Imagine x32, but on ARM64 instead of um, x86-64 is exactly what it is. The reason that x32 has some uses, as has claimed uses, I've never seen it, I've never run it myself to, to agree or disagree much, is that you get a significantly bigger number of registers than you do on i386. So you're not register starved, you get better performance. And you're using 32-bit pointers, so you, do, so you don't use as much memory in typical code. X32 should have a, a win on benchmarks. I've never seen any, convinc any convincing numbers. Admittedly, I've not looked hard. ARM64 IOP32 <laughs> is exactly the same thing. It's a 32-bit pointer ABI running on 64-bit hardware, so with the 64-bit instructions. It is not the same as A32, which is the 32-bit ISA that is standard on ARM. Um, so they're not at all binary compatible, um, but they're claiming that it, sh it will make porting your 32-bit code to ARM64 easier if you, don't, if you don't know how to port code, essentially. <laughs> Well, and that's exactly it. It's, it's, so run your 32-bit code in 32-bit rather than port it properly. Um, Do you want to grab a mic? So just as a remark on, yeah. on x86-64, there is actually a true performance gain. So if you use Intel's uh, own C++ compiler, it has this flag which does auto ILP32, and it analyzes the oh, code, and it yuck. will just generate x32 x code. Yeah. There is, I mean, we can see that on the build these. It is quite fast, but as you said. How much of a difference do you see? Do you have a percentage? I mean, obviously, it depends on the code you're running. Well, it can be up to 50%. Okay, wow. I, I'd seen people talking about maybe 5% in typical code, at which point I don't think it's worth it. So ILP32 on ARM64, um, gives you smaller memory usage so you should get better cache life. Um, the other thing is it also does extend you from the 16 registers on um, A32 up to the 31 registers available on ARM64. But to be honest, with 16, you're not register starved on almost any code that's sensible anyway. Unless you're doing hand-optimized assembly, you're never going to notice. Um, so we don't see the same performance improvement uh, for ILP32 that you might on X32. And we've, you know, I don't think it's worthwhile any of the general purpose distros caring about this in any way. ARM64 is 64-bit, use it, is, is, is my take. Other people will argue, I think they won't. <laughs> so, unless anybody has any last points, we have just overrun by a couple of minutes now. Uh, maybe I, um, the uh, last one, care about ARMEL in this room. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I want to know uh, what specific uh, work need to be done uh, to still include the ARMEL in bust stage. Um, we need people to basically pick up on bug reports as they happen if they are ARMEL specific. That they tend to be quite rare because most of the people running ARMEL don't tend to file bugs. I do. I just fixed OpenJDK on ARM. Okay. Open JDK on ARM. Um, we need people to, be, to get involved in the tool chain um, areas and make sure that things continue to work. So deal with issues as they arise. Upstream folks and the tool, ch tool chain people in particular are, have been pushing us for quite a long time saying they don't want to support this anymore. Um, you'll need to talk to them to find the exact details. Um, I will admit I ceased caring a while ago, so I, I have lost, I've, I've stopped tracking it, I'm afraid. Um, mention on the, if you want to get involved and make ARMEL continue, please announce that on the Debian ARM list, make a point of looking for the bugs and talking to people and go from there. We haven't taken it out of Buster yet, but we will soon unless we see, unless we see that happen. Okay. And now that really is um, past time. Thank you for coming along. As I said, I will send a summary to the list later. 
Um, please, if you want to get involved, get involved. We are, we're friendly. We don't bite much. Thank you. Sure.